Have you ever had a hard time submitting to authority? Most of us are probably answering with a resounding yes. We just don't like being told what to do or how to do it. We learn it as toddlers, man. As soon as we can start walking, we are off and running, just doing what we want to do. It doesn't get any easier as we become teenagers. In fact, that's why teenagers struggle with their parents' authority. They're starting to learn to make decisions on their own, and they just don't want to be told what to do. It reminds me of that story that I heard of the kid who was told by his dad to sit down, and he refused. And so they went back and forth, and finally, with the threat of his life, the kid sits down, but he looks at his dad and says, I may be sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. We just have that attitude ingrained in us. We just want to be our own boss. Don't tell me how fast I can drive. Don't tell me what color I can paint my house. Don't tell me what clothes I have to wear to work. We all struggle with that because we like being the authority in our life. And let's be honest, sometimes rebelling against authority is exactly what needs to happen because sometimes authority needs to be replaced. I think about history. We love looking in history at those that have rebelled against authority. Even the country that we live in, America, we were founded on people rebelling against the nation of England, wanting to make their own choices. And there are times when authority is abused and needs to be rebelled against. It needs to be resisted, maybe even replaced. But what happens to us is this mentality of being our own boss of making our own choices, figuring it out on our own. It, sometimes uh, we guys in the room, man, we, we feel like this is the manly thing to do. We just have to be in charge. And so we become these alpha males and no one's gonna tell us what to do. But let's be honest, that's not just limited to guys. A lot of us, we have it ingrained into us from the start. We think about the fact that we live here in America and we're all about the land of the free. Or maybe our parents raised us to be independent thinkers, and so we want to think for ourselves. We want to do our own thing. Some of us have learned it through authority figures abusing the power or the influence that they have on our life. Maybe some of you listening today have had those that were supposed to protect you, maybe parents, maybe teachers, maybe those in authority. They've abused their power. And so we become weary of and wary of authority. We don't want to listen to what those in authority have to say. And so we build these walls. And these walls are meant to protect us and our emotions and our feelings. These walls are, are meant to um, not let people in. And so we build these walls so we can be in control. We have our own kingdom. We have our own independence. But today... As we begin this talk, I want to ask you this question. I want to ask you this question. What would my life look like if I wasn't in charge? What would my life look like if I wasn't in charge? Because I want to encourage you today. There's someone that's worth listening to. His name's Jesus. And Jesus is someone that won't let us down. Jesus is someone that cares about us, that has our best interest at, her, at heart, and he's worth listening to. He's worth following. So today I hope that you will just, just let that wall down a little bit. Just allow uh, the truth of Scripture to speak to your heart today and be challenged by what you hear. But before we jump into it today, let's just take a moment and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today that we have an opportunity to spend some time in your word. And God, I ask that our hearts would be open to what you have to say. We ask that you remove the distractions around us. Maybe uh, as we sit here watching today, there's kids making noise or it's a beautiful day outside and we're distracted. Lord, I just ask that we would be able to focus in on your word for the next few minutes. Lord, that we would take what you would say and we would apply it to our lives. And we'll give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we are in the book of Mark. And Mark is the second book of four to start the New Testament called the Gospels. And the Gospels are just stories of Jesus' life. And, and some of the stories match up in these Gospels. In fact, the story that we're going to look at today appears several other times in the Gospels. 
But we're in the second week of Mark on Rewind, and we're going through the book of Mark backwards because we want to look at Mark from the point of the death and resurrection of Christ. We know what happens in the end, and so now we want to see how that changes our view of these stories that we see in this book. And last week we jumped into the book of Mark and we talked about how in Mark chapter 14 we need to lay down our purpose, we need to lay down our pennies, and we need to lay down our presence. So today we're going to continue that story and we're going to be in we're going to start in Mark chapter 11 and end in Mark chapter number 12. So if you have a copy of the scriptures, if you'd open them up to Mark chapter number 11, we're going to be in verse number 27. Mark 11 and verse number 27 says this. And they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Now here comes a group of religious people, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. And instead of being excited about what Jesus was doing, and, and what they're referring to is him out there uh, performing miracles and having this following, and basically instead of being excited about Jesus being here and, and speaking the truth, they are upset because he's going against the way that they know. He's cutting into their authority over the people. And so they said, what better way than to question his authority and to ask him whose authority he's operating under? But the problem was Jesus wasn't going to play along, and Jesus doesn't answer their question. In fact, he kind of turns the table on them, and he begins to ask them some questions about whose authority do you think John the Baptist baptized me under? And man, that messed them up, because if they said God, that means that he's in control. And then if, if they said man, it would upset the followers of John the Baptist, who had just been beheaded not long ago. And so they have some issues, so they refuse to answer them. And so Jesus says, all right, so I'm going to jump in then and I'm going to start speaking to you in a parable. Now, a parable was a story that they could relate to, something practical, but it had a deeper meaning uh, than what you would take at face value. As a kid, I learned it was an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so he starts telling them this parable about this farmer that had some land. And so he, he plants a vineyard on it. But not only does he plant a vineyard, it says that he builds a wall and he builds a wine press and he builds a tower. And so he has everything necessary for this land to be successful, for it to grow grapes so that he can press wine. And he allowed some people to move in on the land and to take care of the land. And they were allowed to live there, the tenants, so that they took care of it and they took care of the crop that would come from the grapevines. And so about the time that the grapevines should be due for harvest, he sends some other servants to check out what's going on, to see what the profit is, maybe to see, hey, do you have some money for me? And what these tenants do, what these people do that were living on the land, they either beat or they killed every servant that he sent. And here's the reason for that. Tradition tells us that if a man owned a piece of land and he had a, a vineyard on it or he had a crop on it and he allowed tenants to move on there to take care of that crop, if that land didn't yield fruit for three years, then the land became property of the tenants. It was taken from the landowner because they were supposed to make their, land, their living off of that land. And so more than likely, these tenants didn't want to pay off because they wanted to take over this land. And so finally, the farmer says, listen, I'm going to send my son. Surely they'll listen to my son. But what do they do? They kill his son. And so we pick up the story in chapter 12 in verse number nine, where it says this. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He goes on to say this, And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. So there's so many, um, there's so many nuggets in this story. There's so many things we can dig into. And probably if you're following along, you're figuring out, oh, yeah, there's some things here. First of all, we see the land is probably our life. And God is the farmer. And he takes care of us. We're the tenants. 
And then, of course, his son is Jesus Christ. And what Jesus is saying to this religious crowd is he's saying, listen, God set you up for success and he sent the prophets and you beat them and you killed them. And now he sent his son and really Jesus was forecasting his death right here. And the reason that these religious leaders, the reason that the chief priests and the scribes and the elders had such a hard time with Jesus was they didn't want to submit to his authority. He was cutting in on the authority that they had over the people. He was cutting in on them, the people listening and doing exactly what the chief priests and the scribes and the elders told him to do. And they didn't want to submit to his authority because they were selfish. And see, in our life, it's the same thing. When we refuse and when we don't want to submit to the authority of Christ, selfishness always gets in the way of surrender. And in our life, that's so difficult because it's hard to surrender everything. I remember as a kid growing up in church, one of the hymns we would sing at the end of service was, I surrender all. And it tells us, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender I surrender all. And we struggle with that because it's easy to sing, but it's hard to let go of everything. Paul understood this and he encouraged us to die to self when he wrote in Galatians 2 and verse number 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But surrendering all is so difficult. It's so hard to let go. What are we holding on to? What are we not willing to surrender? What are we being selfish about? Maybe it's that lust or desire that we don't want to surrender. Maybe it's the desire for wealth or recognition or power or fame. Maybe we're selfish of our time. Maybe we think, hey, I give God an hour each Sunday. I'm at church. What more do you want from me, God? Maybe it's the attitudes towards someone that's hurt us. Maybe we say, God, I'll follow you, but I, I'm just not ready to forgive that person. Don't ask me to forgive that person because I want to hold on to that bitterness. I want to hold on to that hurt. Selfishness keeps us from surrender. So the chapter continues. And the religious crowd finds another way to question Jesus. This time, the Pharisees and the Herodians come at Jesus. Now, the Pharisees and the Herodians usually didn't get along. They didn't see eye to eye. It would be like the Baptists and the Catholics coming to Jesus and asking a question. And yet on this front, they unite and they say, listen, do we have to pay our taxes? And so Jesus says, bring me a, a denarii, bring me a coin. And so he said, whose picture's on the coin? And they say, Caesar's. And he said, we need to give to Caesar or render to Caesar what is Caesar. But he also says, render to God what is God's. Basically, he's telling them to submit to authority. Just a quick side note. I find it interesting that Jesus lived under some of the most oppressive government ever, and yet you don't find many messages on government in Jesus. He just said, submit to authority. But we go on. And they didn't like that answer. And so the Sadducees come to Jesus. Now, the Sadducees were a religious, a religious sect that they believed in the book of Moses, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's all they read. They didn't read the prophets. They didn't read the Psalms. They only focused in on those books. And they didn't believe in the resurrection. So that's why they were sad, you see. Just a little joke for you today, Sadducees. But they come to Jesus and they make up this hypothetical question. They say, what, 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 ha what would happen in heaven, uh, God, Jesus, if, if a woman marries a man and he dies, and so then she marries his brother and he dies, and then she marries his other brother and he dies, and then she marries his, and they go on and said, she marries all seven brothers and they all die. Now, my question is, number one, wouldn't you think one of the brothers would figure out this was not the lady you want to marry? I mean, three of my brothers are already dead being married to her. I'm not marrying her. There's just no way. But back to the story, the Sadducees say, who is going to be her husband in heaven? Now, who sits around and thinks of questions like this? I mean, why did they go to seven? Why wouldn't they stop at two or three? Why seven? But they come up with this question. So Jesus realizes this is ridiculous, but he goes ahead and answers them in verse number 24. He says this, Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? 
For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. He goes on and says this, and as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses? Basically, this is a zinger by Jesus. He's basically being sarcastic. He says, have you not even read the book that supposedly you're all about? Have you studied it? In the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am, not I was, but I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Jesus said, this is a ridiculous question that you've asked. He calls him out on the spot. You claim to be religious and that you don't understand even the law that you study, the scripture, and you don't understand the power of God. You're focused on these hypothetical questions, these things that really don't matter instead of letting God's power and his words speak into your life. You're missing the point. In ministry, many times we are asked some pretty obscure questions and we come across some pretty bizarre beliefs. Many times people want to focus in on a verse maybe that can be interpreted in several different ways and they want to know your opinion and then when your opinion doesn't line up with them, all they want to do is argue about it. And then there are those who want to disagree with the parts of scripture that they just don't like what it says because it calls for them to give up authority in their life and not make their own choices. And what happens is when we begin to question the authority of Christ and his word, we tend to focus more on tension than we do on truth. Instead of focusing on the truth of scripture and letting it speak into our lives, We're focusing on the tensions. And listen, we should be students of the word. We should uh, study it front to back and back to front. We should be in scripture. We shouldn't be afraid to ask questions or dive into difficult passages. But when we allow our knowledge or our so-called knowledge of scripture to start puffing us up and we focus in on the obscure, when we're looking to fight over scripture more than we are letting the truth of God's word change us, Really what we're doing is we're fighting the authority of Christ in our life. We should be encouraged. We should be uh, challenged by the truth of Scripture. Psalm 25, 5 says, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Psalm 19, 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. What truth do we need today? Maybe you need to hear that you're wonderfully made. Maybe you need to hear that you're a chosen people. Maybe you need to hear the truth that no weapon formed against you will prosper. Maybe we need to hear the truth that our God is a jealous God and he loves us with everlasting love. Maybe we need to hear that we're safe and secure in him and that he has removed our sin as far as the east is from the west. Maybe we need to hear that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Or maybe that even when we're in the valley of the shadow of death, he is with us. See, a surrendered life focuses on the truth, not the tensions. One last question came Jesus' way. After Jesus has answered the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees, here comes this lone scribe. And he, he liked the answers that he heard Jesus give. Something in them spoke to his heart. And we see in Matthew, the parallel passage to this, that he was a Pharisee. He was a lawyer. He was part of the religious group that studied the law. See, they had figured out that there were 613 precepts. There was 365 negative precepts and 248 positive ones. And so this scribe comes to Jesus, and I believe that he asks a genuine question. He says, Jesus, of all these precepts in the law, what is the most important one? What's the number one? What's the one I should really focus in on? And so Jesus answers him in Mark 12 and verse number 29. He says this. Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. He goes on to say this. 
The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Love God and love people. And guess what? Someone finally agreed with Jesus. Look what the scribe says in verse number 32. The scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than a whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. He gets it. Jesus says, listen, of all these 613 precepts, the most important one is love. Love for God and love for others. What Jesus was trying to tell him is that when we understand the authority of Christ in our life, relationship has priority over rules. Here this scribe was a student of the law, and yet something began clicking. He began to understand that All those laws were there because the relationship hadn't been restored yet. And we stand here today looking back and knowing that Jesus gave his life on the cross and rose from the dead three days later so that that relationship, that relationship could be restored. We understand he desired relationship over rules. He gave up his life so that he could have that relationship with us. Submitting to his authority isn't about a bunch of do's and don'ts. is isn't about him taking control of our life and just making us mindly, mindless robots. No, it's about having a relationship with him. And so what about us? Are we more concerned with the rules or the relationship? Do we submit ourselves to him? Whose authority are we operating under? Are we focused in on those rules so much that we become bitter? Maybe when that generosity bucket passes in front of us and we say, well, the rule is I've got to get 10, give 10%, so I'm going to give my 10%. Instead of having that attitude that, hey, God challenges me to try and outgive him because I never can, and so I'm going to give him out of the abundance of my heart. Do we focus in on the rule of loving our neighbor? And so we have a neighbor that drives us nuts. And so we grit our teeth and says, well, uh, Scripture tells me and Christ tells me I have to love you, so I'm going to love you. Or do we do it out of the abundance of love that Jesus has for us? And we understand that Jesus loves the unlovely. Or maybe some of us, we love rules. We, we like a list of rules. And so as, as followers of Christ, we, we love that rule list. Uh, read your Bible. Check. Uh, go to church. Check. Uh, pray, check, be generous, check, serve, check. And so over and over, we love to put those little check marks next to the rules. But instead of that, instead of uh, focusing on the relationship, we've made it all about the rules. And we lose the idea of loving him and loving our neighbors because we're so focused on rules instead of relationship. So we go back to that question that we asked at the beginning. What would my life look like if I wasn't in charge? It's a tough one. What would my life look like if I wasn't sitting on the throne? There's one more uh, passage that I want us to see. In verse 34 of Mark chapter 12, Jesus responds to that scribe and he says this, and when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You are not far from the kingdom of God. Where are we today? Maybe we are in the kingdom, but maybe we saw ourselves in that first story. And we're the tenants and we want to take control of our own life. We want to have the authority. Maybe we need to be reminded that we need to follow Christ means to surrender over selfishness, to focus on the truth over tension, and to value the relationship over rules. 
What are we struggling with? What are we holding on to? What are we not willing to surrender? Are we diving into scripture? Are we, are we actually spending time letting scripture speak to us? Are we leaning on the promises that we find in the pages? And where's our relationship right now with Jesus? Is it more about the rules for us or are we focused on the love we have for him and the love he has for us? Or maybe today you're like that scribe and you're not far from the kingdom. Maybe you're right on the edge, but it's hard to let go and give up control. Trust me, I know this, I am a control freak. I want things just a certain way. Just so you guys know, every Sunday, I straighten the chairs in our auditorium because I want them to look a certain way. I have a hard time letting go of control. Maybe that's why Jesus challenges us to have faith like a child. To let go of our pride, to tear down that wall of separation. To strip away our need to be in control and trust him. When we do that, we find out that he loves us and that he cares about us. And he doesn't let us down. He wants what is best for us. So today, maybe we need to tear down that wall that separates from him, that wall of sin and selfishness and pride and fear and doubt, maybe anger. We need to enter into that relationship with Christ and allow him to have control of our life because his way is so much better. And if that's your desire today, if there's never been a time in your life when you turn from your sin and you turn to Christ, today could be that day. If that's your desire, I'm just going to ask you to say this prayer with me. This isn't a magical prayer. It's just words. But what's more importantly is what is your heart condition? Does your heart want to surrender to Christ? And if it does, say something like this. Say, Jesus, today I confess my sins to you. And I believe that you are God and that you died and rose again for my sins. And today I wanna set my pride aside. I wanna confess my sin to you and I wanna surrender my life to you. Thank you for dying and rising from the dead for me. Now, if you prayed that prayer today and you meant it in your heart, congratulations, because that is the best decision you could ever make. We at Miles City would love to come alongside you and encourage you. And if you would just do me a favor, if you would text the word Miles City to the number that you see on the screen, one of our staff will reach out to you this week and we're just gonna answer any questions that you might have. We're gonna pray with you. We wanna encourage you because doing life together is better. For the rest of us that are in the kingdom, who's on the throne of our life? What will our life look like if we aren't in charge? 